This presentation of In Their Own Words is brought to you by The Honor Project and is dedicated to the brave men and women of the United States Armed Forces. Recording interviews for The Honor Project gave us the chance to meet some remarkable veterans, like Medal of Honor recipient Walter Ehlers. In November 1940, he and his older brother Roland joined the Army together and fought side by side in North Africa and Sicily. In the spring of 1944, they trained with the 1st Infantry Division, prepping for the D-Day invasion. I want to talk a little bit about uh, infantry and what you saw in combat. What is the infantryman's perspective on war? When you're in the infantry, uh, of course, uh, you know you're the one that's being shot at all the time or you're being bombed or you're being uh, strafed. You're uh, subject to all the mines and things like this. So as, a, as an infantryman, I, you go through the whole gamut of uh, warfare. You have to make the assaults on the beaches. You have to make the patrols at night, which are scary. Uh, you go out into territory you've never been into before and expect to come back alive, you hope. And, and uh, it's, it's a harassing uh, type of uh, work <laughs> in wartime, you know, because it, uh, you're always ex uh, overexposed to everything. You're the very tip of the spear, so to speak, that uh, it's, it's the grunt on the ground that wins the territory that... Uh, well, we secure the territory. Yeah, so. <laughs> what, uh, what, what goes through your mind when you're about to, to enter combat? I mean, face to face at, at you know, arm's distance from the enemy at times. What, what's running through your mind? Uh, well, self-preservation. <laughs> you just want to stay alive. And, uh, of course, the, the thing that's going through your mind is... Uh, one of the things that we were trained to do is always to look for cover. Uh, if the enemy fires on you, you always are prepared to take the nearest cover, and so you're always observing where you're going to be if something happens and uh, what you're going to do after it does happen. When you're out there heading towards the uh, enemy, uh, you're always observing the terrain to find out if you get fired on what you're going to do for the next thing. Uh, of course, when you first get fired on, you usually take the nearest cover and then uh, try to figure it out from there, whether you're going to go around a hill, over a hill, or, or anything. We didn't, uh, one of the things in the infantry that uh, we believed in was not a frontal assault that's going to get a whole bunch of people killed. If there was a way to get around it, why, we would. <laughs> Did you feel you were well prepared for combat? Well? well, I was because I had uh, two years of training. See, I went into service in 1940, and the first combat I was in was in October 1942 when we landed in Africa. Yeah, I fought across Africa. Of course, the biggest battle I ever was in for one solid day was in El Guitar when we were assaulted by the German Panzer Division. They had a valley that they were coming through to break through the lines of the American side units, and uh, uh, they were uh, assaulting. Our artillery was across the valley in the back, and they were firing on the enemy, and we were up on a hill. And uh, they assaulted our hill because we were firing on them, too, and so they assaulted our hill, and uh, uh, we fought a whole day there. Our unit. Uh, company got a citation. We killed 200 Germans assaulting the hill that day. Also, that's where I, uh, where we got shelled by our own artillery. We had a forward artillery observer who uh, was calling in the uh, location of the Germans, and he got it in reverse order. And uh, so the artillery fired on our position instead of down on the Germans. <laughs> Almost got killed that day. So uh, I had a lot of training, and then by the time we got to Normandy, I had a lot of training, <laughs> experience then. 
which so made a big difference. What was the uh, the advice that you may have received? Any old soldiers, any senior enlisted that put their arm around your shoulder and said, hey, look out for this or be wary of this? Any, any kind of tips that you got that you might remember from somebody that helped you? Well, um, of course, when I went into combat, there wasn't any old soldiers around, you know, they, they were World War I veterans, that was over 20 years ago, so there wasn't any in the service that were in World War I, not in our outfit anyway. So I uh, didn't have anybody to, to really comfort us that way. I think years later though, you know, World War II veterans had a chance to do that for the Korean veterans. Korean veterans had a chance to do that for Vietnam veterans and so forth, because we have some men who like in the Medal of Honor Society that were in actually three wars. Well, I had the opportunity to do that to men because I'd already been through a couple invasions, and so I had the opportunity to do that with my own squad and so forth. But you want to remember, I'm kind of a tunnel vision perspective on <laughs> on uh, on this war, and so uh, I can only see it from from a squad's uh, point of view. Uh, the overall view, of course, uh, I'm sure that. Uh, other people have different ideas about it. What is the squad's point of view when you talk about that you're limited to that tunnel vision? What do you see? What do you know? All you know is that you're in, in danger at all times and that you're the one that's uh, facing the enemy head on. And, uh, and you're not only facing the enemy from head on, but you're facing it from up above, such as air war, you know, and you have. Uh, all kinds of destruction weapons going against you. You have the artillery, you have the mortars, and you have the machine guns, and and uh, the rifles, and the and the infantrymen, and and then the airplanes strafing you, and things like this. Everything is you're just subject to it all when you're an infantryman. So you're dealing with a well. It's, it's obviously a stressful and terrifying situation. How do you cope with that? What do, what do you tell yourself? Well, some people didn't cope with it. That's the reason you have people in mental hospitals and things like this. Uh, other people, um, I guess, has to do with their background their, or the makeup uh, of the person that uh, is able to survive. I was able to survive, but I think it was mainly because of my being raised on a farm and having to survive the depression and things like this. and and. Uh, it, it, it helped me tremendously as far as my military life is concerned. But I know other people who were never exposed to uh, that kind of life, who came from cities and so forth, just weren't experienced on how to handle uh, country situations. And that's what usually uh, infantrymen are doing. They're fighting out in the countries. They do fight in the cities too. Of course, that's when the city guys come in handy, you know. <laughs> But uh, usually when you're taking countryside land and things like that, it's your experience from being raised on a farm is uh, going hunting and, and uh, camping and things like this, uh, it helped tremendous. What did you expect of the German <coughs> soldier? What were you taught? Oh, we about? were, uh, we knew that the German soldier was a good soldier, uh, that they were good fighters, and they were intelligent fighters. We also knew that we were better than they were. <laughs> That's what we always felt that we were. That's probably one of the reasons why we were able to cope with the situation. We felt that we were a better fighter than they were. On June 6, 1944, Walter Ehlers landed on Omaha Beach. When you're, when you're landing on the beach uh, at D-Day, describe to me what the mood is, uh, you know, you hear about the proverbial fog of war, uh, and no one knows exactly which direction to turn. What, what, what was going, what was happening? Down well, the one thing, you're scared as hell, and the second thing is that you know that, uh, that if you stay on that beach that you're going to get wiped out, and there's no boats back there to back you up because uh, they aren't going to take you off. They left you there, so you've got to get inland, you've got to get up there and get cover and so forth. And, the only way to do it is to knock out the enemy. It's the only way you're going to survive. And I think that's that way on any beach. Any any veteran who's made a landing on the beach knows that uh, you aren't going to survive on the beach. You just got to get off of it. 
the emotion is that you're scared and uh, and you're going to use everything that you have been taught to use to gain the advantage over the enemy when you, after you have landed on the beach. Before the invasion, the company commander anticipated heavy casualties, so he separated the Ehlers brothers. They were several hundred yards apart when they came ashore in different landing craft. My brother was in a different company. He landed on with uh, on this LCI, one of these ships, and uh, his uh, he was he had a mortar squad, and uh, he and his whole squad were on the ramp at the same time, coming down, and a German 88 shell hit the ramp and knocked out the whole squad at one time. And I didn't learn that he was killed in action until about the middle, middle part of July. But uh, uh, they told me he was missing in action, and I figured that, well, he wasn't missing in action if he was, because I knew my brother better than that. My brother was my hero, you know, <laughs> and I knew that he wouldn't be missing in action if, this, if it was all possible. He either got killed or else uh, he was so badly wounded they had to take him back to a hospital, and they didn't have a record of it. But uh, I suspected that from the time that they told me that he was missing in action that he'd been killed in action. I saw the ship get hit, but I didn't know that he was on the ramp at the time and so forth. So. I didn't have to carry that with me, knowing that I saw him get killed or something like that, no. How, how did you find out that your brother had been killed? Uh, his company commander came over and told me, and I was, we were inland about uh, eight, ten miles off of the beach, and we were waiting for them to clear up the Cherbourg Peninsula at the time, and uh, so our unit was holding ground. And uh, his company commander came over and told me that uh, he had been killed in action. And all I could do was cry like a baby, but <laughs> there wasn't anything else for me to do. During the invasion, Walter Ehlers acted with outstanding bravery, earning the Medal of Honor. He was a very humble man, and he reluctantly recounted his actions for us. Well, in, uh, in a two-day time, I knocked out, uh, the first day I knocked out an enemy patrol, and the next thing I knocked out two machine gun nests, and the next thing I knocked out a uh, mortar position with eight men in it. It was actually two mortars in the uh, position. And then I knocked out another machine gun nest, and the second day was on the 10th of June. I knocked out uh, another machine gun nest, and then uh, we were in an unintended position in a hedgerow situation where we had to withdraw back to another hedgerow. So in order to get my squad back, I stood up and uh, f fired continuously all around me so that the squad could withdraw back down the, one of the hedgerows back to the next hedgerow. And then one of my men got wounded. And so I helped him off the field of fire. And uh, then I went back and recovered his Browning automatic rifle that he was carrying because that was one of the what well, was one of the only automatic weapons we had with us at that time for a squad, you know, and so naturally we needed that for our firepower. And uh, and I got wounded at the same time. I got wounded just before I when I was wounded. I carried him back. He was wounded too. And then uh, that's about it. <laughs> what, what made you stand up? And, and Expose yourself, enemy fire. I don't know. <laughs> oh well, uh, I, uh, you know, I, up to that time, I never lost a man in my squad from D-Day. I didn't have a man get killed on the beach. I had lost a man up to that time. So uh, I thought I was, I was trying to save the lives of my men, as far as I was concerned, I guess, and to get them back under cover. And then I would make it the best I could, you know. I, I just never thought about myself. I probably was thinking more of them than anybody. But that's the way it is in combat. You, you don't really think about yourself. You're thinking about what's going to happen to the other guy. And I guess 
you get kind of a satisfaction that you survived it too. <laughs> once this happens, once this has, has finished, is there anything that, that ran through your mind? Like, what did I just do? Or did it seem just business as usual to you? I never even thought about it. I used to hear people talk about those things, you know, like guys who'd like to get a Purple Heart. You know. They're in the foxhole, hold up their hands when they get a wounded or something. <laughs> but uh, get that million dollar wound so they could get off of the front lines. Uh, I heard a lot of people talk about it, but I never wanted to get wounded, but I got wounded anyway. The fact is, I, during the war, I got wounded four different times. I got wounded by mortar fragments, I got wounded by bomb fragments, and I got wounded by riflemen. So. Yet you, you, you just kept pushing and kept yeah. moving ahead. Well, towards the end of the war, uh, it, it was getting to me because, see, this is uh, the third invasion and and uh, I'd been wounded three times and towards the end of the war when it was, we'd make assaults and then I was a second lieutenant and a platoon leader. And I still was out leading my men and when we'd make our assaults, why, I would uh, get the sick that's in my stomach. I thought I was going to die, you know, or something like that, uh, until the first shot's fired. When the first shot's fired, all that thing goes away. You, I don't know what happens to it, but it goes away. But I can see why people get sick from, you know, the anxiety, the knowing that they're facing an enemy and not knowing where they are and where the shots are going to come from or anything like that or where the fire power is going to come from. And until that actually happens, uh, you go into action, everything like that part you forget all about. It, you don't feel it anymore. You, you're only concerned with how you're going to get out of this thing alive, I guess. Euler's had no idea he'd been awarded the Medal of Honor. I found out about the Medal of Honor by uh, reading about it in the Stars and Stripes. I was on a, uh, see, when you get wounded in World War II, they put you in a, after you recover from your wound, they send you to the repo depots. And that's what we, we call it recycling, you know. <laughs> and they send you back to the uh, front lines. And of course, I was on a, a train and uh, I was reading the Stars and Stripes and I read about my having received the Medal of Honor. And of course, a friend of mine who was in my brother's company uh, told me, he knew us by our last names. And he says, uh, hey, Eaglers, he says, uh, I'm reading in the Stars and Stripes here where your brother got the Medal of Honor. And I said, yeah, I'm reading that too. But I didn't tell him it was me <laughs> that he was reading about. So went on back to the outfit, got back to the outfit, and uh, and I didn't know that the colonel even knew who I was, you know. But uh, I was still a staff sergeant then, and he said, uh, "Ailers, what the hell are you doing back here?" I said, "Well, uh, I'm reporting back to duty, sir." And he said, "Well, you're supposed to be back in Washington getting the Medal of Honor from the president." And I said, uh, well, I've never had any orders to go any place but back here. And uh, so actually what was happening is that the orders didn't catch up with me. They sent out the orders apparently and they'd send them from one command to the other, like to the hospital, to the repo depot, and then went back to the unit eventually. And uh, so they finally caught up with me in, in uh, Belgium. I was up there at the beginning of the bulge and uh, they promoted me to second lieutenant and then uh, uh, when the bulge started to break it out where they said they had to get me issued the Medal of Honor before I got killed so they put me on a jeep and sent me back to Paris and that's how I got the Medal of Honor from JCH Lee in Paris, France. So I didn't get mine from the president himself but uh, President Roosevelt did sign my citation. Do you consider yourself a hero? Uh, not any more than any other GI does, I don't think. <laughs> who are who who do you who are your heroes? Who do you consider? Uh, my brother was my hero. My brother was, you know, in the infantry too. He, he was a squad he was a scout when we were going across Africa. I used to see him out a mile or two ahead of us and I was in the back with the company, you know, and I used to think you know, it used to make me sick to see him out there knowing that the enemy was pointing guns at him, but they'd probably let him by and fire on the main unit when it come by or something like this. But uh, he was a great scout and 
and he was a, a, a good soldier. He was a fantastic soldier. So I guess he was my hero, but uh, um, all these guys that gave their lives for their country are, are heroes. And uh, you can't take that away from them. It's, they're the ones that really made it happen. And of course, the rest of us survived. I, uh, we helped make it happen, but the point is is that uh, we were all on the line, and it could have been any one of us. And we're just one of the lucky ones that got out of it. Walter Ehlers talked about how he still dreamt about his brother almost every night, but he said he didn't feel any anger about the tragic death. I'm not angry because uh, he went out there to lay his life on the line just like I did to, to um, get rid of a tyranny that was, uh, that if it had been let go, I would have probably taken over the world and we'd have been a heck of a mess. Uh, I think the biggest reason that, uh, that I felt justified fighting is because uh, Hitler tried to do away with the Bible and uh, all religions, and uh, so I think that uh, that was one of the biggest reasons I felt, because I felt that uh, I was a Christian soldier, I mean, that I was fighting uh, for the, what we believed in in the United States, and, and uh, I think I think we got the greatest country in the world, one nation under God, you know, and uh, I think that's the way it should be, and. If Hitler had had his way, why we wouldn't have been a nation. So, so to to face an enemy soldier, you're. I, I wasn't. I I never hated anybody in my life, you know. I, I and I still don't hate anybody. Uh, and I I didn't hate the Germans either. All I know is that German soldiers were probably under and uh, uh, you know under orders from their higher command, which uh, one way or another they didn't know how to deal with, and uh, consequently they were out fighting for their country, we were fighting for our country. And, uh, and I, I just think that uh, we were doing the right thing and they were doing the wrong thing. They probably thought they were doing the right thing, but uh, uh, I don't think we should hate them for that. After the war, Walter Ehlers continued to help other soldiers, working as a counselor for the Veterans Administration. In 2014, he passed away at the age of 92. He was the last survivor of the 12 soldiers who received the Medal of Honor for actions in the Normandy campaign. In addition to interviewing veterans, the Honor Project also collects recordings from the front lines. The following are the words of soldiers recorded from the battlefields of Europe during World War II. This is the Army Hour at the 7th Army Front in Eastern France. We're in the thick forest of the Vosges Mountains with the men of an infantry company. It's been raining, there's a gray, sullen sky, and the ground here covered with leaves is soaked and muddy. For the past two weeks, this infantry company has been edging forward in the forest, moving up yard by yard, digging out German machine gun nests that you can hardly see until you're on top of them. It hasn't been an easy job, and the Germans have often struck back, throwing in heavy artillery and mortars. A few minutes ago, shells were whistling over our heads, some landing not far away. But here beside our wire recorder are two infantrymen, looking rather tired and cold, who can tell you more about what's happening here. They're Sergeant Alfred Hook from Menden, Massachusetts, and Sergeant Louis Pelosi from Somerville, Massachusetts. Well, Louis, ever since you fellows got into this woods, it's been pretty hot, hasn't it? It certainly has. The Germans been making it pretty hot for us here with all their artillery and mortars and small arms fire all around us. Where do you sleep at night? I have a dugout, and it's covered with logs and dirt on top of that. Al here has a pretty good setup, too. I've got a buddy who reads all the newspapers and keeps us pretty well posted on what's going on in the world. He's also got a shirt he thinks quite a lot of. Seems he bought this shirt all from the States. 
when the division came across. It's so old now, it's almost falling off. So at night, there's no moving around in the dugout. He's afraid it's going to rip. Okay. What do you fellas think of this close-in fighting? It's pretty tough here. We, we can't see the enemy, and they can certainly creep up on top of us before we know it. Keeps out pretty busy here. I have to maintain maintain patrols 24 hours a day. These patrols go behind our own lines to see that no Germans infiltrate and cut us off. Have you taken many prisoners here? No, not so many. Only they come in in twos and threes at a time. What do they look like? They seem to be pretty well fit. Good. Nicely dressed, are they? Yeah, they got good and nice new uniforms. Well, do they always come in in twos and threes like that? No. Just recently, in the early part of the campaign, they came in like flies. Lewis can tell you about that. One night, the sergeant and I walking up the road, and two Germans come out the road to us. One had a flashlight, and it was lit, and the other had a white flag. They come up to us and wanted to surrender. Well, we started walking down the road when the officer who could speak English stopped and said he had a whole company in the woods. Well, that surprised me, but we finally got them out in the road and got them all lined up in a column of twos and started walking them down. We walked about two or three hundred yards when he stopped me again and told me that his men all were armed and they were tired of carrying their weapons, wanted to know if they could throw them down the ground. So I said, okay, throw them against the side of the road, which they did with a bang, two or three rifles going off. That scared me, and I jammed my rifle against the captain's stomach, and he reassured me it was only an accident. So we started off again and got them all back. Well, that was quite a night, wasn't it? It certainly was. We got about a thousand prisoners that night. What will you fellows be doing here tonight? Going out on patrols, the same as every night. And how long will you have to keep those patrols going out like that? These patrols will go out every night until we break out of this forest. Okay, fellows, thanks very much and good luck. Yes? Tonight patrols will be going out, probing the enemy lines, and perhaps there'll be an attack tomorrow. There's a lot of these woods to be taken between here and Germany. From the front line here in eastern France, this is Corporal J. McMullen returning the Army Hour to New York. Late yesterday afternoon, Captain Don Woody took an Army Hour wire reporter to the command post of the infantry company, which is fighting on the outskirts of the city of Orange, east of the Earth Canal. Captain Woody. A company of this battalion is presently advancing on a hill, which we can see off here to the east. And you can probably hear in the background the sound of the uh, artillery and the small arms. That's a machine gun at the moment. As they cover the infantry, advancing uh, to take that hill. We don't have any carries are up there. On this side of the canal, of the Earth Canal, uh, we do know that they've been putting up a pretty stiff resistance. C Company of this battalion, uh, under cover of this fire, is going to be flanking the hill to the north while A Company moves in to the middle. Now, when they get up there, uh, they are going to have an excellent view of Cologne. That, in fact, will be about six kilometers from the outskirts of the city. In the meantime, elements of the 8th Division to the south of us are attacking along the main Durham Cologne Road. From where we sit, it looks very much as though the German tenure on Cologne is to be very short indeed. Standing with me is Captain Jack Harmon of, what is that town again? Amarillo. Amarillo, Texas, who is the executive officer of A Company. And I think he can give us a little better idea of what is actually going on here. Captain? Uh, a Company is laying down a covering fire here on the hill. C Company is flanking around from the north. So the covering fire is the machine gun. Yeah, machine gun, mortar, and cannon. Cannon from the tank. Yeah. Thanks for really laying it out now. We have five of them lined up out here, really putting out a lot of lead over there. You can see the tracers going through. Right. Then under cover of that fire, you have, uh, who is actually attacking the hill? Uh, Charlie Company's taking the hill. They're practically out of there now, I imagine. Germans haven't been too tough through here. They have not been too tough. No. What are you going to have when you get up there, Captain? Can you give us some idea? Oh, uh, we ought to have a mighty good OP there to look on clone from there. The uh, terrain from there on is, is uh, pretty much flat country. Is that the idea? That's right. This looks like about the last of the hilly country we have to go through to the Rhine River. I see. And when do you expect to be in Cologne? Well, we keep 
deep on. It shouldn't be long. We've been traveling pretty fast through here. All right, thank you very much, Captain. During the past week, the First Army uh, had a jump off with the night on the uh, early Saturday morning. As it traveled across the Royal River, come up to the Earth Canal, passed it, and is now on the plane uh, overlooking Cologne. This is Lieutenant George Fuller with the Army Hour in Germany. Our recording machine is set up in the cellar of a battered German house a few thousand yards behind the Ninth Army front lines on the Ruhr River. All is quiet on this western front tonight, but in just four hours from now, this same battlefield will be a roaring hell of fire and steel. For Lieutenant General Simpson's same Ninth Army is crossing the Ruhr tonight, two hours before dawn. The plans for the attack have been well laid. Every man from the general to the doughboy knows exactly when, where, and how he is going. Plans have been so closely guarded that even telltale divisional shoulder patches have been removed from the uniforms of men concerned in this operation. Here in this heavily guarded artillery command post, Lieutenant Colonel Lewis D. Beeman of Dixon, Texas, is giving his battery commanders their last minute instructions before the attack jumps off. You know our objectives across the Royal River. The infantry is now building up for the crossing, which will take place tomorrow morning. H.R. at 0330 hours, with the 2nd Battalion making the initial assault. Our artillery preparation begins at H-45, or 0245, along the entire line. And our scheduled fires last until H-210. You have data sheets telling this firing, and will follow them at the prescribed time without further order. Time will be synchronized again just prior to 0245. Fires after H plus 210 will be on call from forward observers. Radio silence is lifted at H hour. Time, when I say now, is 2324. 10 seconds. 5, 4, 3, 2, one, now. Are there any questions? No questions, sir. All right, gentlemen, here we go again. Give them hell. Colonel Beeman has just given his battery commanders their last minute instructions. The stage is set. We attack in four hours. Now stand by, Army Hour, while we move our recording machine farther forward to the gun battery site and wait for each hour. Okay, here we are at the gun battery sites, Army Hour. It's early in the morning. In exactly 35 seconds will be H hour. 35 seconds till H hour. I've got my stopwatch out. A few guns in the background going off already. Just a little warm up. Otherwise, all is still. Beside me is the gun commander. Next to the big gun. And there I'm the around it. Eight towers approaching. Stand by and listen for the command. There he goes. Come on out. A big 105 going off. This recording is U.S. General Anthony McAuliffe's live report from Bastogne, France, during the Battle of the Bulge. The Germans bombed Bastogne at night and strafed occasionally during the day. On the 22nd, the German commander, ridiculously enough, demanded surrender of the surrounded town. I just replied nuts, for I knew that one word best expressed the feelings of the division. The wounded were wonderful. No words can describe their cheerful acceptance of a tough situation. On Christmas Day, the Germans launched their biggest attack with infantry and tanks in large numbers from the west of Bastogne and the rear of the position. Prisoners later told us that their officers had told them that Bastogne was to be a Christmas present for the Fuhrer. 
The Christmas present consisted of the number of hooks that lie in the center of the ground back of Bastogne now, destroyed by Americans and the infantry repulsed at the same time. On December 26, at 5 p.m., we made contact with friendly troops. Through it all, no one doubted for an instant that we would hold the town under any sort of attack the Germans could put on. The 101st Airborne Division has met and defeated the Germans in Normandy and Holland and will continue to do so whenever called upon. This is France for the 7th Army's 15th Corps. Perhaps we're not speaking with the same spirited voice as the announcer you just heard back in New York, but there's good reason. We're seeing the reality of war. Our wounded men brought to a medical collecting point. They're brought here by litter bearers, or if they're able to walk, they walk back to this point. We're standing in deep mud. It's bitter cold, and it's beginning to rain again. There's a mixed smell of balsam wood and medicine here. There's a group of medics and wounded men around the fire, burning old shell cases to keep warm. These wounded have been given treatment. They're waiting for a jeep or an ambulance to take them back to the rear. Let's speak to these men who only a few minutes ago met the enemy's fire just over that ridge a few hundred feet away. Here's a man over here who's been wounded in the shoulder. What happened to you, soldier? Uh, I was hit by an 88, fragments of an 88 shell, which exploded around 10 feet away from me. We were pinned down in an open field by enemy machine gun fire. I see. And here's another soldier here, wounded in the arm. And what happened to you? Well, our mission was to take and occupy a certain part of the wood. Well, we went through, all right, until we got into an opening. Then machine guns opened up on us and got practically half of the company. Then I tried to edge over closer with another fella to try to observe the fire. But the machine guns opened up on us, killing the man next to me, wounding me. Are you men all right now? Yes, I'm quite all right. Uh, I think it's mainly due to the fact that we have the medics with us. Uh, my platoon, we've had something like 25 days of combat. Uh, three different aid men. Uh, on one occasion, uh, one medic was hit in a hole and was quite seriously wounded. On the other occasion, uh, the medic was wounded after having crawled something like 2,000 yards, uh, caring for other wounded men on a combat patrol. Last night, uh, another medic, which was attached to our platoon, was hit by a mortar, and despite the fact that he was hit, he took care of something like six wounded men uh, throughout the entire night, and I think he deserves tremendous recognition for it. Then you have all the admiration in the world for these frontline medics, right? I do, very much so. How about you, soldier? I certainly do. With the busy fall season just around the corner, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef prepared dietitian approved ready to eat meals delivered straight to your door you'll save time eat well and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle too busy with your end of summer goals to cook but want to make sure you're eating well with factor skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping prepping and cleaning up too while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality you need Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy, then get back to crushing your goals. Level up with Gourmet Plus options prepared to perfection by chefs and ready to eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, 
and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. This August, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash warriors50 and use code warriors50 to get 50% off. That's code warriors50 at factormeals.com slash warriors50 to get 50% off. Well, I'd like to speak about a certain medic that done a grand job there, but he's not alive right now. Well, he was hit by his machine gun also. He got hit in the leg. He nice himself up. He continued on treating the other men that were laid out in the field. He kept on treating until he was hit again, and, well, he's still laid there. And I'd give him anything to see that man alive again. All right, soldier, thank you very much. I think the ambulance is ready for you two men just about now, so you can take off back to the hospital in the rear. There's a lot over here. His barefooted feet caked with mud. The medics tell me he has trench foot. He removed his shoes to the spot and couldn't put them on again. He walked that way almost two miles. He's smoking a cigarette now and drinking hot coffee. He says he's okay and the medics are making sure. This is Lieutenant Carl Zimmerman speaking from a muddy hillside in the cold rain of eastern France. The Army Hour returns to New York. This is Lieutenant George Fuller with the Army Hour on the northern sector of the Western Front. Another week of relative inactivity has passed on this 9th Army Front. But from our position close to the Ruhr River, the battlefield is far from quiet. Huge 90mm anti-aircraft guns of Battery B is 135th AAA Gun Battalion Mobile, commanded by Captain Wellington Yappel of Detroit, Michigan, are blasting German positions a few thousand yards to our front. In fact, we are so close to the Germans that these ACAC guns, ordinarily used only on enemy planes, are now being employed to destroy enemy ground. There they go. Another... Surrounded on all sides by the hell and stench of this battlefield, soldiers still find time at the end of the week to turn to God and give thanks for another week of divine guidance. Major George Dome of 129 South Madison Street, Allentown, Pennsylvania, chaplain for this outfit, and former assistant pastor of Christ Lutheran Church, Allentown, is now conducting his weekly service here on this battlefield. His jeep is parked off to one side of the guns. His altar is the jeep hood of the blue and white cross chaplain's flag draped over the radiator. There is no organ and there is no singing, for music drowns out the telltale whine of incoming German artillery shells. A few men are standing around, listening to the service. Their foxholes and underground dugouts are only a few feet away. They're of all faiths, Catholic, Jewish, and Protestant. For this is a general service conducted to fulfill the needs of all faiths. Chaplain Dome is now delivering his address. In the background, you There's a feeling of me that religion has failed. I have tried to find some trace of that feeling among the men here in the front lines of Germany. I have not been very successful. Therefore, I have trying to believe that religion has definitely not failed. If there is any question in the minds of people as to whether or not there is a God above us, I can definitely ascertain that that question is not a part of the average American soldier's mind. Here a man has found God. Here there is a definite knowledge and a belief and a faith that there is a God above us who guides us and who takes us by the hand and leads us through the valley of the shadow of death where we will fear no evil. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and one day soon give thee peace. Chaplain Dome has finished his work now. The machine the ground are still rattling at German positions. The men quietly move back to their gun positions. God bless you, America. This is the May 2nd, 1945 broadcast of the German forces' surrender in Italy. German forces in Italy have surrendered unconditionally to the Supreme Allied Commander. The instrument of surrender, the first formal surrender by a German army or armies since Allied troops first stormed the shores of Europe nearly 20 months ago, was signed at 2.14 Italy time on Sunday afternoon, April 29th. The surrender became effective at 2 p.m. Italy time today. All German and Italian forces under General Heinrich von Wiedinghoff, successor to Marshal Kesselring as Commander-in-Chief of the German Southwest Command, formally laid down their arms just four and a half hours ago. The war in Italy is over, and this is probably the first announcement to the listening world. The document of surrender was signed in a small chamber at Allied Force Headquarters in the great royal palace of Caserta, north of Naples. Since last July, the palace has been headquarters of the supreme allied commander in the Mediterranean theater. A white-haired, red-faced, stocky Englishman, Lieutenant General W.D. Morgan, Chief of Staff to Field Marshal Sir Harold Alexander, signed for the Allies. Two men in civilian clothes, a lieutenant colonel and a major, signed for the Germans. 13 generals and staff officers of the Allied land, sea, and air forces in the Mediterranean looked on. A Red Army Major General, A.P. Kislenko, was there for the Russians. Six men, of whom I was one, were present for the American and British press. The negotiations that culminated in this scene at Caserta were short and swift. A few days before the signing, the German command in northern Italy got word through to us that it was ready to sue for surrender. On Saturday afternoon, April 28th, an army transport plane bore south through a driving rainstorm and landed at the Caserta airfield at four o'clock. There were two civilian passengers. One was tall, blonde, blue-eyed, square-jawed, and terribly tense. The other was sleek, small, dark, and apparently unmoved. The tall German, a lieutenant colonel, had papers authorizing him to negotiate on behalf of General von Wiedinghoff. That meant the German 10th and 14th Armies and the Italian Ligurian Army, an enemy force that totaled perhaps 600,000 men. The dark and unperturbed German was a major. He represented General Karl Wolf, Supreme Commander of SS and security troops in Northern Italy and Western Austria. That meant perhaps another 250 or 300,000 enemy troops. There were many reasons, of course, for the secrecy. There were particular reasons for the civilian clothes. The German generals were acting on their own. As far as is known, they negotiated this separate surrender without consulting their higher command. They were prepared on their own to carry out the surrender terms without instructions from above. Negotiations at Caserta began late Saturday afternoon. Lieutenant General Morgan led them on the Allied side. By Sunday morning, he had convinced the German delegates that surrender must be unconditional or not at all. In the small chamber at the Royal Palace, eight spotlights were trained on a long table, behind which hung a big operational map of the Po Valley. The table was bare, except for a pen and inkwell at either end. The walls were bare, except for the Po Valley map and another map of Vienna. The ceiling bore the coats of arms of various Italian provinces and one souvenir of another era, the sign of the fascists. It was two o'clock and staff officers were buzzing importantly in and out, arranging the formalities involved in the supreme military act 
of surrender. At five minutes after two, the door to the right opened and the Allied officers filed in. Among them were American and British generals, rear admirals, and an air vice marshal. General Morgan came last. As he stood at his end of the table, he seemed the embodiment of all you think of as a British army general, red-faced, impeccable, and utterly calm. An Englishman next to me remarked, he looks like General Haig. It's extraordinary. The door to the left of the long table opened. The two Germans stepped in and halted awkwardly before the waiting inkwell. The tall lieutenant colonel stared a moment defiantly at the spotlights. His blue eyes burned as they rapidly took in the assembly. His throat muscles were taut and his hands were clenched fiercely behind his back. But he stood firm and erect like a soldier as General Morgan glanced down at him the length of the table. The little German, the dark major, stood to one side unruffled. Despite the contrast between the gold braid and pomp of uniform of the Allies and the checkered sports jackets and bright ties and flannel trousers of the Germans, there was nothing ludicrous, no hint of incongruity in this dramatic scene. General Morgan began. In a calm, unemotional voice that was cutting in its firmness, he addressed the Germans. I understand that you, Lieutenant Colonel X, are prepared to sign terms of surrender on behalf of General von Bietinghoff. And you, Major X, are prepared to sign on behalf of General Wolf. Is this correct? The tall German's throat muscles quivered, and he replied in a hoarse voice, Ja. And the little German said, Jawohl, when the question was translated to him. General Morgan continued. I have been empowered by Field Marshal Alexander to sign on his behalf. The terms of the instrument of surrender will take effect at 12 noon, British mean time, on the 2nd of May, 1945. I now ask you to sign the documents, and I will sign after you. The German colonel's tension had mounted as General Mo Morgan spoke. It was as though the enormity of defeat and the finality of his present act of total surrender had now hit him with a cold shock. Perhaps the spotlights angered him too, but whatever he felt, he did not lose his self-control. He asked to repeat a statement he had made at previous meetings. In a husky voice, he said for the record that he had received limited powers from his commander-in-chief, that he had been forced to overstep those limits, that he assumed his commander would approve his action, but that he could not be absolutely sure. General Morgan replied casually, we accept those conditions. The German sat and signed five copies of the surrender document. General Morgan signed last. Three copies, one of them in German, were given to the German plenipotentiaries. Two were kept by us for the Supreme Commander and the Allied governments. General Morgan explained this to the Germans and said, gentlemen, I ask you to withdraw now. The Germans went swiftly out. It was 17 minutes after two. The ceremony was over. There had been no show of victory on the side of the Allies, only the tone of cool authority of General Morgan's voice, his easy manner, his quiet dignity. But for the Germans, it had been overwhelming defeat, the end, the last nail in the coffin. The frontline troops involved in this surrender are those we've been fighting here ever since we landed at Salerno. They are perhaps the best in the Wehrmacht. They comprised 22 divisions from two German armies, including one panzer, two panzer grenadier, and two parachute divisions, which were always among the Germans' finest. It's impossible to estimate their number today, but at the start of our offensive in northern Italy, the 22 divisions were believed well up to strength. Their total at that time, an AFHQ staff officer estimates, was 600,000. They are all the German troops in Italy, as far east as the Isonzo River, where the next German territorial command begins. General Karl Wolf's SS and security troops are mostly in the rear. They are, in fact, almost wholly in Austria. Wolf's area command covers the Tyrol, part of Carinthia, and the province of Salzburg. The part of Austria roughly west of a north-south line through Salzburg itself. The troops under the two commands of Wolf and von Wittinghoff probably totaled close to a million one month ago. The surrender which two Germans in sports clothes signed last Sunday 
means more than the end of the war in Italy. It carries us automatically across the Alps. If all German troops obey the surrender conditions and lay down their arms, we will clear the whole route of the Brenner Pass in a single swoop and reach northward to within a few miles of Berchtesgaden. We now bring you the text of a statement by President Harry S. Truman. Here is a statement by the President of the United States. We quote, The Allied armies in Italy have won the unconditional surrender of German forces on the first European soil to which, from the West, we carried our arms and our determination. The collapse of military tyranny in Italy, however, is no victory in Italy alone, but a part of a general triumph we are expectantly awaiting on the whole continent of Europe. Only folly and chaos can now delay the general capitulation of the everywhere defeated German armies. I have dispatched congratulatory messages to the Allied and American officers who led our forces to complete defeat of the Germans in Italy. They deserve our praise for the victory. We have right to be proud of the success of our armies. The statement of the President continues. Let Germany and Japan understand the meaning of these events. Unless they are lost in fanaticism or determined upon suicide, they must recognize the meaning of the increasing, swifter moving power now ready for the capitulation or the destruction of the so recently arrogant enemies of mankind. The President has sent the following message to Field Marshal Alexander. On this momentous occasion of the surrender of the German armed forces in Italy, I convey to you from the President and the people of the United States congratulations on the signal success of the Allied armies, navies, and air forces under your command gained only by persistent heroic effort through many months of a most difficult campaign. I send also to you personally our appreciation of the high order of your leaderships which conducted our armies to their complete victory. End quote. Step back in time and discover the untold stories of history's greatest heroes. From ancient civilizations to modern times, the Anthology of Heroes podcast takes you on a journey through history, uncovering the bravery and determination of those who stood up for what they believed in. These aren't just stories from old history books, they're the human experiences of those who fought for justice, freedom, and their principles. From the defiance of Vercingetorix as he stood against Rome, to the unwavering spirit of Skanderbeg as he faced down the Ottoman Empire, each episode is a journey through their life as we follow their triumphs and their failures. Meticulously researched with quotes and observations from primary sources, Anthology of Heroes is the perfect blend of expert research and engaging storytelling. So listen and subscribe now on your favorite podcasting app.